Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's installment of the Newark Museum of Arts Lunch and Learn series. My name is Elena Munoz, and I am one of the curatorial assistants at the museum. My guest today is the artist Courtney Leonard. We welcome your comments and questions, and we'll be answering them at the end. If you are joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature. And if you are joining us on Facebook, please leave your questions in the comments section. Courtney M. Leonard is a member of the Shinnecock Nation, which is based in what is now referred to as Long Island, New York. She is a multimedia artist and a part of the offshore art movement, which is concerned with climate change and its effect specifically on the oceans. Utilizing ceramic, sculpture, video, and painting, Leonard creates immersive installations that address the relationship between human activity and the oceans and waterways. In 2015, she was an art and embassies artist. In 2018, she was recognized with a National Artist Fellowship from the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. Leonard's most recent and ongoing series, Breach, engages indigenous culture indigenous coastal communities, excuse me, around the world to explore how cultures can survive when their existence is threatened. Her latest installation is at the Hood Museum, Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth on view through the end of 2021. Her work is in the Newark Museum of Arts collection and installed in our Seeing America galleries. Again, if you are joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A features for a uh, Q&A feature for any questions or comments you might have for Courtney. And if you are joining us on Facebook, please leave your comments, uh, your questions in the comments section and we will get to them at the end of Courtney's presentation. So with that, I will hand it over to Courtney. Wonderful, thank you. Seem to have some tef technical difficulties for a second right now. Um, I somehow lost the uh, the full screen. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing uh, one large image and uh, I believe this is the beginning image of um, Breach and I wanted to just uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Courtney Leonard Shinnecock from Long Island, New York and I currently live in Santa Fe, New Mexico and for about five years or so I've been looking back at issues that our community has been facing um, from afar, but then also relating that to how I grew up um, on Long Island and traveling. And I had noticed um, a great deal that our waters are rising, our coasts are receding, and how do I relate uh, to that today in terms of uh, my work and my passion and uh, whatever possibility I have to help my community and others. Uh, so as I was looking back to home, I started to think about a time uh, when I had my first experience with a whale that had come to our community in 2004. And um, uh, when I was looking back, I was thinking about our whalers. And I was thinking about the whale when it rises uh, through the surface. And that particular wor word is called breach. Uh, so when I looked at the definition, English being a language that is imposed on indigenous communities, it's not our, uh, it's not our language, but it's the language that we uh, primarily use. And um, when you look at the English language, there's one word in multiple different definitions. So uh, breach is an act of breaking or failing to observe a law or agreement. It's a gap in the wall and it's making a gap and breaking through the wall. It's also the rise and break through the surface of the water um, of that of the whale. Uh, next. And uh, in 2000, 
2007-2009, we had been facing uh, different hurricane issues and high seasons of hurricane, one of which was uh, Sandy. And when I was back home, I noticed how uh, far the waters rose in terms of its impact on our community and our territory, which um, fortunately in terms of other indigenous nations in the US, we've never been re relocated from our traditional territory. Uh, the map on the right hand side of that is that of the Long Island and it just shows you uh, the different indigenous communities to Long Island and to the East Coast. And uh, in terms of the Newark Art Museum and that territory, I'd like to acknowledge and, uh, and give gratitude to the Lenin Lenape people from that area. Uh, our community is on the east end of Long Island. And if you look at the aerial view of Long Island, it's in the shape of a whale. And that in and of itself is significant to our people in terms of uh, our connection to the whale, the whale as ancestor, but also that one whale would feed us through winter. And, uh, and so that sustenance, that connection is something that is tied to our symbiosis and our connection as a people um, in our cultural landscape. But then I also was witnessing um, as the waters were rising and as our loss of coastal reefs continued to occur, that there would be these man-made systems that would be placed in nature. And they would often be made out of rebar or plastics, foreign entities to fix something that man had messed up. So it's basically like putting a band-aid uh, or giving a band-aid to somebody, but not helping them to heal, even though you're the one that cut them. And, uh, and so when I think about these situations, I, I try to pose questions in my studio. And the question I believe that I'm following for breach is can a culture sustain itself when it no longer has access to the material that fashions that culture? Next. Um, my work is ultimately a call and response to what I witness in a yearly account similar to our men who were hired on for their knowledge of the ocean and the whales during the Yankee whaling industry. And during that time when you're on a shipping boat um, far away from your home, you begin to document and account in all sorts of ways, whether it was the log books that uh, noted how many whales the ships would take in for the banks, or if it was the shipmen themselves uh, carving a scrimshaw tooth or um, drawing, uh, singing songs, thinking of home. So this kind of call and response that I first began with Breach was in 2014. I created this palette of sperm whale teeth and that was looking back to that whale that had been hit by a shipping boat and had uh, its carcass had washed ashore on Dune Road side, which is like the Hampton side that borders our reservation. Um, and at that moment, I sat there with the whale and my mom helped bring a bag of clay out and I fashioned a whale tail and I just um, was, was present. I think that's probably one of the most things about witnessing is to be present and not necessarily to respond right away until you know what that response might be. Um, but with access in terms of the imposition, um, our culture is not allowed uh, to have access to the whale being that it's federally recognized unless we go through the succession um, system and letters uh, being that we are currently federally recognized but at the time the whale washed ashore we were state recognized uh, due to our nation's uh, treaty agreements with the Dutch colony of York versus the US government. So how does the community relate to imposition when their government and societal structures existed before another government that super is trying to supersede us. Uh, so there's a lot that's happening in terms of our continued uh, rights um, and, and fighting for those. Uh, next. Uh, so material is a key component of my work. I do have clay, I don't have ivory. Uh, so I started to fashion those teeth out of clay. But I also look at currently where I am positioned in New Mexico, which has over 19 different Pueblos, respective communities, uh, Zuni, Apache, uh, Diné communities. And if you look at the right hand side, this map shows you an account of all the oil and gas wells in New Mexico, active and plugged. 
So you can see the relationship to extraction that exists in this state, as well as the extraction that many, many states um, throughout the US are, are dealing with. So the mining of coal, um, the mining of uh, uh, mica, the mica that I have found to use in this clay that's made here in New Mexico is actually shipped and imported from China. So what is this kind of responsible relationship we have of retraction or extraction to, um, to an international global level. Um, next. Uh, I tend to kind of ebb and flow between one work and then thinking about that work in another way. So I call my work studies. And so looking at that first um, breech palate tooth with the 48 sperm well teeth, uh, sometimes when you have density in a pile, you don't see it, but then if you spread it out, people will start to witness how many uh, actually exist in a field. So this is a 14 by 14 foot uh, bed of sand, and the whale teeth that I fashioned out of clay are lined on that bed of sand, uh, similar to our shell dresses. So if you look at an aerial view, you can see that connection to pattern, um, but it's also that kind of act of the whale being hit by a ship um, and what's remaining being washed onto the sand and then being pulled back. On the right and left hand side are another variants of a body of work called Artifice, which is the work that's in the Newark Museum. And that's looking at uh, coastal restoration projects. And so that's fashioned out of raw clay and I knock it down and um, place it back into the installations uh, when I have that opportunity. Uh, next. Uh, there was a series that I also created after a mass fish die occurred on the east end of Long Island. Uh, that was about 2015, and uh, these are Mahedans that had washed ashore in Peconic Bay. Uh, we have a lot of different reasons that that occurs, uh, warming waters, different migration paths of predatory fish, um, but also there's um, algae blooms from the uh, density of the population of Long Island and human waste going into the bays and not having enough time to oxygenate and give oxygen to the species that live in that area. Uh, and, and then we have these mash fish, fish dyes or calls to not eat the food because it's toxic. I responded by weaving these uh, baskets out of clay and that series is called Abundance and it's kind of looking at the fragility of the environment and the um, fragility of uh, clay as a material. The basket will never be used and um, we can't really fill our baskets at certain times. Next. Uh, yes, John. So also looking at um, the basket. No, thank you, dear. I, um, I was invited to respond to the location of um, Pomona Claremont College uh, area, which is Tongba um, territory. And, uh, and I was also looking at the collection there and I started to think about how um, a non-Indigenous person often labels things that are at, in museums that were taken um, during the time of colonization or stolen from areas. And I, I wonder who has the authority to give um, another word to something that it was never called that. So there's a, a certain basket that's from uh, Northern California, Pomo territory. It's a, a Pomo burden basket that was in that exhibition or in the collection. And the form of it looks like a, an amplifier. And there was a hole in the lower portion of that basket um, that I, you know, I thought about the weathering of a material and its fragility. Um, being held in a drawer and how somebody else gave it a different word. And um, for ind indigenous philosophy to be able to carry a basket to feed your community, that's not a burden. Um, that's actually uh, filled with love and gratitude. So I opened up a new version of fish baskets that are talking about that trap isn't our word. We didn't lay traps to kind of um, block a whole species in the rivers. And then also the carrying of food, the intermodality of exchange was what led into that um, response of that exhibition. And if you look at the ports in San Francisco, this is an image on the right hand side, I was traveling up and down the coast of California. The amount of um, goods that our US community uh, acquires from overseas is um, actually 
impacting the whales more so than indigenous communities that still have the rights to harvest and feed themselves locally um, through the hunting of whales. So I know it's an issue that people um, want to stop, but then they often don't look at their own responsibility that the majority of whales killed per year are struck by our shipping industry. And that shipping industry is in our ports and then it goes by uh, trucks or it goes by rail into the interior. Uh, next. And, um, oh, I, I wanted to just, uh, I'm getting towards the end. And so I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, how does one kind of begin a path of seeing and looking at your surroundings and responding to them? Um, when I was younger uh, in social studies, different history classes, uh, we would have to write papers about our culture and um, who we were as a people and it have to be cited. And I remember going to the Southampton library and looking up um, books about our community. And often when we were written about by people outside of our community, we are written about in a way that, um, that we no longer existed, that we perished on um, the Circassian, which was a boat that was, um, a cargo boat off of uh, Meacock Bay in Bridgehampton that our men were forced um, by gun force to unload during a storm and then they didn't make it back to shore. Uh, that was written in books as if then our whole bloodline died. And I'm a 15 year old kid reading this wondering um, who gives someone the authority to determine my invisibility or visibility. And I think that led me into um, this path in different ways of trying to create space in spaces that were never made for us in terms of museums and institutions and collections. Um, how do our next generations have access to our narratives from our people? Uh, those are key components in my drive for breach. Um, next. Uh, and so I think um, at this point, again, I'd also like to acknowledge that, um, uh, again, going back to when I was little, uh, studying art history in art class, they never acknowledged um, indigenous art or cultural arts beyond um, Georgie O'Keeffe came to the you know, Santa Fe Southwest and look at these floral paintings. Um, another artist that I was introduced to uh, who I admired was, um, is uh, Louise Nevelson's work in different ways of shadow and light and cast. And, uh, and so artifice exists in the Seeing America gallery of um, Newark. It doesn't exist in a separate space that's just one culture or community. It's human beings together in a way having a conversation about abstraction. And I felt, um, I felt pretty honored uh, to have that moment where uh, the Shinnecock work that talks about coastal erosion is in the presence of a space and documented in a book uh, in a way that I never would have thought when I was 10. Um, and I hope that it's carrying the issues and the stories and the narratives of what is happening to our coastal communities, acknowledging that climate change, however you want to define it, and the Anthropocene is a fact. And, uh, and that we are bearing witness in different ways and how do we do that as artists uh, to leave, leave an account and a, a documentation in a different way. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and you can just start this one. So over the summer, um, I had an opportunity to do a residency on Captiva Island in what is the Calusa territory and uh, Seminole people aren't too far away as well. Uh, I was looking at Rauschenberg's interview videos and he talked about his work, uh, Racing de Kooning, um, where he took a de Kooning painting and he, he painted on top in, in this act of erasing another artist. And, and how does that, for myself, I thought about how does that deal with erasure for indigenous voices or erasure for the potential of breach um, when opportunities don't arise for me to extend the conversation of these issues. Um, through an exhibition or a show or a space or um, 
of funding. <laughs> um, there's a lot of notions of erasure that I understand. And so I wanted before anybody erased breach to do a study of my own self erasing breach. So that was um, one moment in uh, Captiva Island where I just um, took some time. And I also wanna acknowledge um, Ariel Frost was another artist in residence who's a composer who helped me with the video. And um, I really appreciate collaboration and uh, community and that kind of um, aspect of process in, um, in our artistic practice. Uh, next. Uh, that study eventually uh, led me into the current exhibition that's at the Hood Museum and it's uh, Breach Logbook 20. I've now done uh, six years of breach logbooks in different variations of looking at either water quality issues, coastal erosion, subsistence harvesting, um, different impacts that we face yearly. And uh, this particular exhibition, Nebulous, is looking at ghost traps, um, the waste that's caught, um, the whales get caught in, seals get caught in, leftover crab traps and crab lines, lobster traps, and just general waste of human beings within the ocean, plastics. Um, and so this was looking at the Connecticut River and the Wilder Dam and that imposition of dams uh, flowing from Connecticut River down into the Long Island uh, Sound and the Atlantic Ocean in that regard. I, I set this up on March 6, uh, just a week prior to um, COVID and the lockdowns and travel bans. And it's been an interesting time for me the past three months of witnessing uh, COVID, um, witnessing potential issues with water waste management, um, witnessing death. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, all of those who have lost people um, and those uh, journeys. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know what will happen next, but there will continue to be a breach logbook. And uh, this exhibition, I believe, will be up through 2022. It's been extended in terms of um, the outreach that we hope to have with it at the Hood Museum. Uh, so uh, Tabutni, thank you very much. And Thank you, Courtney, that was, that was fabulous. Um, so now we have our question and answer portion. Um, and again, um, I just want to invite people to submit questions if you are on Zoom using the Q&A feature or if you are on Facebook Live to use the commenting feature. Um, and our first question comes from um, Judy Kravitz. And she asks, what is your primary medium? You are so diverse. Do you work in a separate studio? So I guess it's a, a couple of questions. Um, one. <laughs> okay, um, so I, I, I believe that's, I believe it's important that we should know where our materials come from. And um, I predominantly work in ceramics, um, but I also paint. Uh, when I paint, I usually use clay mixed in with like gel medium or acrylic, because um, that's basically what paint is, is a pigment and um, a binder. Uh, so I flow between painting uh, photography sometimes, but I wouldn't call myself a photographer. I just like the lens as an act of documentation and that kind of square space sometimes that we use for Instagram. Uh, I also do um, little snippets of film that I equate to kind of memory flashes. If I do installation work, I like to think about human senses. And, and so there's a reason why I, like I love, I love clay, um, but you can't ask like a human being to be everything and you can't ask a material to be everything. So you have to understand when is the right time to call upon somebody in the community to do a task or when it's like, you know, good, you've, you've overworked that person. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I do what I have to do. And in terms of space, that's the same thing. Um, I've worked, like with a breach, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world and build family and community in terms of um, my indigenous people who are also uh, facing coastal erosion, um, facing water quality issues, facing mining and extraction. So I've um, been up to Mi'kmaq territory with um, Alan Silo Boy, uh, Franny Francis, Charles Doucette for an indigenous artist exchange. That led me into uh, taking saplings and coiling with them and then doing an ephem ephemeral work of a whale tail that we floated in, in the harbor. 
Um, so I think material is a relationship to that answer about space. I have a studio right now, um, but uh, probably be venturing out of this space, have a basement, have the outside. Uh, so I make do wherever I am. And I actually have a question for you based on um, part of your answer is, I know you've talked a little bit about working with other indigenous communities. And I know yesterday um, when you and I were doing our run through, you were discussing um, working with other communities and building bridges. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that. Uh, well, coastal, I mean, climate change, all of this is a human issue. And I think when I first started out, I started out from who I am and where I am coming from. Um, but then I wanted Breach to bring awareness to our issues in these spaces. Um, I find that the talking is the most important thing versus like the, the end product. But the, this, you know, art allows me space and time. Uh, to talk, I guess. And, uh, and with that, I have an immense amount of responsibility to the people that I have um, uh, shared story with. So I've traveled um, with Breach. I've been traveling to the places that our ancestors who were whalers, who were hired onto the Yanking whaling boat, uh, traveled to. So up to Mi'kmaq, to that whaling port um, in Nova Scotia now, and then uh, I've been to Aotearoa uh, in New Zealand and looking at our connection in that regard. And some Shinnecock um, men actually stayed back in Aotearoa. And so there's a connection between Shinnecock and Aotearoa in that regard through the whaling ports um, up to uh, 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 Upiabic, um, Anupiak territory and the North Slope of Barrow uh, during the bowhead whale harvest. And I, um, there's certain things that I'll talk about, but certain things I don't wanna talk about um, in terms of protection of community. All I will say is that um, people who are continuing their hunts, who are young teenagers, um, they have been cyber bullied by um, Sea Shepherd and, um, and uh, oh, I forgot his name. It's probably something I'd block out. Paul Watson um, actually cyber bullied this young teenager. And I thought about that idea of, this outside community only seeing one portion of a hunt, they don't see the fact that that hunt feeds their whole entire community and generations and they house portions of it in the permafrost if there is still a permafrost. So climate change is affecting their traditional refrigerators. Um, so people don't want people to eat local or to practice their tradition, which dates a long period of time. So they cyber attacked this young teenager and um, Indigenous youth have some of the highest rates of suicide in this country. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with ex extraction, extraction of every ounce of us in terms of um, what we can and cannot have or how we can and cannot live. And, um, and that affects people. Um, so nobody's doing that when you're eating your food wherever you are. Uh, no one's telling you what you can and cannot post on Instagram to a certain degree um, when it comes to your food shots. Um, but other people's ideologies about how people can eat is actually um, impacting um, immensely. And if you offset that community, the alternative is to fly food in at expensive uh, prices and to actually increase more impact on the whales in terms of importing. Um, than, than what that symbiotic relationship of that community is holding on to. And that's something that we can't have as Shinnecock people. So um, currently today, um, and that's something that I hope Breach is gonna help in some sort of way. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Judy Robinson. Um, she's asking, can you please tell us more about your work at the Newark Museum and what it means to you? Um, so the uh, piece is called Artifice. There's Artifice Ellipse, which I, you know, I think of um, geometry, the, the, um, just the simplicity of geometry is basically indigenous design. If you look at beadwork and weaving and whatnot, um, people don't acknowledge our strength and our intelligence. So I, um, the, the actual shape that ellipse is an aerial view of a whale pod. Um, when you see the, uh, um, 
uh, the drones flying over trying to take scientific documentation. They look like ellipses. Um, an ellipse is also a reference to spirit. And so that's one of the shapes that is, uh, is in, in there through the artifice studies. Um, and, uh, and so I, I also am a bit of a museum uh, studies exhibition design nerd. So I really love the mounting system for that piece. <laughs> um, and I, want, I just wanted to give a shout out to, um, to that. Uh, there's also, um, uh, I, I think, um, I don't know if I expressed it enough, but I think that if a, an artist has an opportunity to be a part of a human conversation, then they need to be with every you know human component. Often as um, a contemporary artist, I might get invited or have had the experience of um, like your work in a Native American gallery versus your work in the contemporary space that it should be. Um, I, I appreciated that experience of witnessing my work as a human being and not just um, typed into a particular space that sometimes people won't even visit if they don't feel it applies to them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and I think uh, COVID has, has afforded me a bit of time to look back at this journey because I'm always going, going, going. I feel like that's maybe what climate change does to you. You don't know how much time you have left. So you have to just keep, you have this urgency. Um, but when you are now staying put and you look back at the urgency that you've established in these spaces, um, I also have to take time to breathe. So um, those are a couple of things that I think about uh, when I had the opportunity to be there um, is just being present and being in that space so that our community hopefully will be acknowledged in, in a long um, trajectory of time. Um, whenever I talk about breach, I don't, I don't sign my work. I don't put Courtney Leonard on there. I don't believe that this work is mine to, um, to sign. Uh, it's a collective work. Um, it's acknowledging everyone and it's, and it's holding that. Um, so I'm really adamant about Shinnecock being on labels. Um, I want that idea of presence in these spaces and the opportunity to continue to teach through, um, through text. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we have a comment from Christine Angiel. I, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Um, who says, I love the first piece that you showed. And um, she has a second comment to follow up to that that says, oops, went too fast. It is a P. Um, and she appreciates the explanation that you gave about um, your piece at the New York Museum of Art. Um, and we have a question from uh, Rosa Guzman. What have you noticed about the changes to the whaling waters slash environment during this pandemic, in terms of reduction of vessels, commerce, and industry? Oh, so um, literally, pretty much every night I, I Google whales. Um, it's just like a thing that I do. Um, also, we'll um, uh, look at other things. Like right now, I'm looking at COVID and water um, and a lot of water waste management studies. I think currently out of University of Minnesota, they're looking at um, the impact of COVID and coronaviruses in the soil off run from the water, um, the density of people who uh, basically COVID is in your system. It goes out your system, that remnants goes down your drain. The density of that remnants is something that people are studying. Uh, the likelihood is that it won't affect um, water that is filtered uh, and uh, chlorinated. Um, but for an indigenous person that comes from a territory that has both um, city connections and groundwater. Um, I've grown up with a lot of fear of water and, um, and whether it's going to, to hurt us or give us cancer or um, other things. Uh, so there's a possibility that um, if the water's not filtered, if it has enough density of that, um, however quickly that impact is, uh, that COVID will be in water. Uh, so you can look that up through the University of Minnesota and the students that are studying it there, and then also University of California, Irvine, I believe. Um, there is a doctor who's looking at mist when people are surfing and out on the water because it's um, uh, moisture particles um, in terms of exchange. Uh, and then in terms of the whales right now, 
The only thing I can say is during 9-11 when there was a moratorium on the whale or the moratorium on our import coming into New York City and that um, acoustic uh, sounds that resonate and often offset their paths, um, hydro boom, um, fracking, uh, those are all things that are impacting uh, navigational um, connections and, and hormone levels of the whales. So during 9-11, there are studies, if you haven't read about them, you can look them up, that talk about the hormone stress levels of the female whales were very low during that moratorium. And, um, and then that gave evidence to the scientists to talk about breeding of females and calves, um, the rate of calves for those uh, females if they were stressed or not stressed. Uh, so I would say in that regard, um, there will probably uh, probably be uh, additional studies in relationship to COVID. And if you know if you keep your shipping um, down, if you keep your relationship to capitalism down, uh, that in and of itself is going to save an immense amount of whales for those of you that care about species. Um, but the only thing that I ask if you care about species, why don't you care about indigenous people in relationship to that? Um, why are saving, why is saving the whale in, in some sort of way more important than saving, saving that teenage boy? Um, those are things that I, I struggle with because I don't actually know where the heart is in that regard, if we're trying to be good stewards towards one another. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Rebecca Mobley. Um, what was your inspiration behind representing 49 teeth in response to the sperm whale? Do numbers often play a role in your process? Uh, yes. <laughs> and it's also part of, um, there's uh, 13 moons in our cal calendar, not the 12 uh, year Roman calendar. It goes by the relationship of the woman's body. There's 28 days in a woman's cycle. There's 13 moons in a woman's cycle. If you look at the back of a turtle on um, Turtle Clan, there are 13 scoots. If it's not like, unless the species is a leatherback or I think another species, you won't see the sections on the turtle. So that relationship of knowledge to taking in account um, yeah, and numbers, yeah, it comes from uh, knowing uh, our relationship to place culturally, but then also looking at science, science is always taking numbers and usually when they take in the material from the whales, uh, when they do the um, International Whaling Commission documentation for whales and the North Atlantic Oceanic uh, Committee, every whale gets a number and it's, it's I don't want to talk about numbers and um, giving species numbers, but numbers in a different way can be um, a not so good memory. And then um, that imposition of numbers when we go to ask for permission to have a relationship to our traditional um, uh, cousin, like the whale, um, we have to get an accession number, we have to get a report. So there's numbers in that regard um, and, and odd numbers. Usually when I do installations, I, I, I do odd numbers so that your eye is always flowing. Um, so there's a lot of power to understanding and knowing numbers. That was awesome, thank oh, you. Oh, the whale though, the 49 <laughs> teeth. Sorry, I didn't get that one. Um, the whale, the 49 teeth, the sperm whale only has teeth in their lower jaw. Depending on the age of that uh, whale, they'll have a different account of teeth. So that particular palette with the 49 teeth, um, that's one whale, that's one account. And, um, and that's what that means. But it also is the one whale that would feed us through winter. And what would it mean to actually have, um, this is actually one uh, from that series. What would it mean to actually have this, but we're not allowed to, to a certain degree because of the ivory industry and ivory laws that are also another issue of making a law that is fixed in a way that doesn't acknowledge that other communities aren't, um, aren't in that same kind of conversation about what's happening um, with elephants and poachers. Um, but it affects our relationship to other materials that are also ivory based. Um, so the 49 teeth are an account of one whale, an account of one strike, and also an account of what you have access to in terms of material. 
Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question. Can we see the Newark Museum's exhibit of Courtney's work? Unfortunately, the museum is currently closed to visitors, but um, when we do open back up, you will be able to see her work in our Seeing America galleries. Um, and the next question is, the introduction was a bit cut off. Would you tell us more about how you began your journey and your merging of science and art, as well as how you are moving forward with educating the generations coming up? And it's from Ronnie Bassman. Um, can you repeat the question one more time? Oh, sure, sorry. Um, would you tell us more about how you began your journey and your merging of science and art, as well as how you are moving forward with educating the generations coming up? Okay, uh, so um, people always ask you like, oh, how, how long did it take you to learn how to do this? And I think that um, for, for myself personally, um, I have had moments where I've done work on um, uh, memory and uh, looking at uh, studies that talk about epigenetics and epigenetics, current studies, Western studies that talk about epigenetics, they are looking at DNA um, having a memory code um, that relates to trauma. They've studied um, mice and, and rats in terms of um, if they're able to pass that memory of trauma related to something through the genes. And I'm, I'm an artist, so I don't know the whole context. You can read the abstracts, but I was just thinking about ourselves as indigenous people. We talk about everything's passed down from your ancestors. And that's just, just general knowledge. And that would be our understanding of memory and DNA coded um, memory is that, yeah, it comes from your ancestors. So I didn't know that just yet, I guess, I, or I had a moment when I, would, I started to make that first um, abundance basket series when I was coiling and weaving the clay. And I was with my friend, uh, Stevie uh, Hukuma, who's um, uh, Maori from um, Aotearoa. And uh, she was visiting here in Santa Fe and uh, we were in this uh, studio together. And as we were talking, I was set out to make this basket. And then after a conversation, I looked down and I had made a, a basket out of clay. And, um, and I didn't really feel like that was all me because I was kind of in this repetitive motion and in conversation and I wasn't really paying attention. And then Stevie acknowledged too, she, you know, was like, wow, like, um, and uh, I think in that moment, I had a, for myself, a personal relationship to my family. Um, my great aunt uh, was a weaver. Um, some of our family members were caners for the backs of chairs. Um, one of our cousins um, was, you know, had diabetes and was blind, but was still able to weave belts and make whisk brushes. Uh, that was sold um, to people on the side of the road um, and, uh, uh, and in stores, like um, kind of old five and dime stores. So um, I think, how did I get into art and science? I think if you learn about who, who you really are as a human, everybody is having an experience with art and science um, from an early age. It's just a matter of holding on to um, kind of that it, for me, it was a matter of holding on to what it was that I was witnessing. Um, I also, uh, growing up, um, my mom was first generation to go to college. And uh, the idea was that all of us as, uh, as kids were gonna go to college. That was really important for our, commun our community, but also family was education. So I actually, uh, my mom ran urban Indian centers. And when I was in Philadelphia in um, the 90s, I did a um, internship in the summer at Temple University. Uh, my intention was to become a neurosurgeon uh, when I was uh, a teenager. And in that way, I would you know, really make my family proud and be the first neurosurgeon. And during those clinical trials of my summers in the 90s at Temple University, um, I was working on Western DNA blots and um, studies for heart attacks and healing the heart, and I would have to extract DNA. Um, I realized that wasn't the life that I wanted under neon lights and following a beeper after four summers of doing that. 
So I secretly applied to art things and it worked out. And then I needed a ride to the art things. So I told my mom, I got accepted to Governor's School for the Arts in Pennsylvania. And I, I switched gears. And instead of going towards college and the sciences, I went towards um, the art. And I think the art, if you understand it in all its capacity, is science. Um, so I don't see the difference between the two. Um, and yeah, it just allows me to, to be who I am rather than being upheld to a certain aesthetic or standard that somebody else is defining for me. Um, that's great, thank you. Um, I know we are almost at time, um, so we're gonna answer a few more questions, um, but I guess this next question kind of builds on or jumps off of what you were just saying, but how did your upbringing help shape you as an artist? Wow. Oh. Um, I have to acknowledge my family, <laughs> my mom um, and, uh, you know, my dad, um, my brother, I have a, um, I'm a middle child. I don't know if that psychologically means anything, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have an older brother um, who is a marine biologist and he, for almost about 10 years, was at the New England Aquarium uh, working as a penguist. He would travel to South Africa to help with um, the penguins during oil spills. Um, my sister is also in um, water in a different way in law and indigenous water policies. Uh, she's currently up in um, Canada, Ontario uh, area. And so between my older brother who is a deep sea diver as well and works for outreach with the sea rovers out of Boston. And then my younger sister who's fighting for indigenous rights um, Clear, clean water uh, has has written a lot as well. Um, I'm I'm the artist in between, <laughs> like, and uh, and I think in that regards, uh, maybe that's what also art and science is in a lived practice. Is that not everybody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, as siblings, we're we're collectively doing that. And um, and I know it comes from. Um, our family, from the support of parents and the support of my extended family, my cousins, my grandpa uh, grandparents. Also, um, not a, sometimes people talk about this, uh, but I am also a mother mm -hmm. and, uh, and my daughter Niepa is nine years old. And when she was born, it was uh, 2010 and there was the Gulf spill. Um, and, you know, when you hold when you carry a child, it is born in water and then it, it hears through water. It has that echolation and acoustic sound knowledge. Um, I think that also, you know, there's a lot of different ways about um, how I grew up, um, but also how I watched something else grow up. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm good for questions away. I'm not sure if I hit the question sometimes. Um, my husband laughs a little bit. Um, is uh, He's also an artist from Frank Buffalo Hyde. And uh, he he says, I, I think in layers. So my responses are usually like, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, related to, I guess, a little bit related to your upbringing. Um, do you think your school system that taught you nothing about your heritage in terms of art or history has changed over time to become a more inclusive program? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's been change. I, I think there's more people wanting to, or acknowledging that they're a part of the system that isn't healthy and trying to change. Um, but I have witnessed that, you know, there are things that my, my mother went to Wellesley when she was 16, and she also did a year at Dartmouth. Um, she was also a part of, um, or supporting um, indigenous rights movements when she was younger. And I think it, it, there are some difficulties when you realize that, you know, um, there are issues on campuses that existed when she was on that campus. Um, and then in terms of teaching, you know, um, my daughter has still witnessed art projects that are like making spirit masks, um, which I, 
you know, just the word. Um, I, don't, I think sometimes people don't understand that they're continuing. I don't think the intention is there, mm -hmm. um, but it does really become quite tiresome to try to fix everything. Um, when, when for yourself, you kind of feel like it's quite obvious. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, I don't want to praise something that still has a long way to go, but I also don't want to acknowledge that there have been different um, steps or situations. And then I also would like to acknowledge that even with those steps and situations, it can just take one, one really harsh moment of pain to bring it all back to where we were. Um, and that, that also is, is really tiresome. Um, so I'm fortunate that my daughter and husband are super comedics and there is also something called Indian humor, um, <laughs> <laughs> which we use to heal. Uh, so sometimes um, making light of a situation through jokes and, and song and different ways. Also just making, making art for me, I have to acknowledge is, um, is this uh, back and forth kind of uh, call and response. And it's a way for, for me to heal as well. And being by the salt water, which is what I miss because I was supposed to be home last month. And um, with COVID and everything, we don't wanna um, risk some of our high risk community members. And uh, so we've been home, but salt water and the ocean is a healing thing for me. So I'm looking forward to um, when it's a healed time for me to be able to, um, to say what I need to say to the water. So. And I, I hope that's sooner rather than later for you. Yeah. <laughs> and we, I think this will have to be our final question. Um, and this question is about the teeth um, that you created. Are the teeth pinched, coiled, porcelain, firing temperature? So I guess this person is asking you about your process. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, the, uh, the teeth, well, I have different teeth. So um, it's good to work with different clays, <laughs> um, but I, the teeth that were on that palette are um, originally, I did five odd numbers that I hand built and coiled, and then I um, cast them, plaster cast process. And then these are slip cast um, uh, earthenware at different um, widths. The different widths allow me to stack in terms of weight. So I go heaviest at the bottom, lightest at the top, uh, because these are just, um, stacked and museum waxed. So they're not glued together. So every time they're installed, um, there's an opportunity of play, which I think is often lost. And um, there's a lot of things I love about the practice of installation that I find to be human is that you can create a space or a conversation or a setting of emotion so that you can extend a reach. Um, but then I think sometimes we negate that that play can exist for the exhibition designer and the curator and the staff there when they want to stack it and however they want to stack it. Uh, so, so that's that. And then um, this particular piece, um, I was honored to uh, be a part of an indigenous artist exchange up at the Evergreen College at, the, um, at their longhouse uh, in Olympia, Washington. And Nora Naranjo Morse was our lead um, elder for the um, Upu is um, Clay and Maori, but my Maori friends were there. Uh, uh, and we all worked together. And Nora brought Clay from uh, Santa Clara that she had processed up there for us to coil and um, burnish. And then uh, we did a atmospheric firing outside together. So this is looking at carbon trapping. So with Clay, if you, um, if there's no way for the clay body to get oxygen, it's gonna uh, suck in the carbon from the burning of the materials like sawdust and different stuff. I love um, this piece for a lot of different reasons, um, the blessing that I had with those artists, but also if you look at old teeth, um, there's an article in Australia, I believe, or Australia New York Times um, 2015 or 16. They um, were able to extract a carbon um, tooth a sperm mole tooth and the size of it, the scale of it was quite large. And it dates back to um, how large that species was, species, uh, was in terms of its history. And so the carbonation of the tooth holding time and then kind of this current, um, this current very 
pearlescent clean white tooth that wasn't buried. Um, so yeah, so uh, different clays for different reasons. I do work in porcelain. It's a porcelain body from New Zealand that uh, Laguna is a company that makes, it's called Frost. Um, so there's porcelains from all different parts of the world um, that melt at different temperatures. And I'm not afraid to use what people call manufactured clay or dig my own clay because all clay comes from the earth. So it doesn't make something more indigenous than something else if you actually are indigenous and honor clay material. Um, but you should, you should know where your stuff comes from and where they mine it from. Um, yeah. Great. Um, and one final, final question, this one coming from Facebook. Um, how do we get more people to acknowledge the healing properties of art, making art, viewing and seeing and being present with art? Also, how do we get more people to see the truth behind what you said about art and science not really being separate? So I know that's kind of a, a big question, but. <laughs> uh, well, the, okay, there's a couple of things I forgot to acknowledge the, I think Ronnie's or the gentleman's question that asked about what am I doing with kids or the future? Um, and also kind of relates to, to this question is um, people don't have a, like there are studies, I'm a big study person. So the attention span of people nowadays, I know is not very long. Um, so I found that uh, there's a couple of reasons why I use numbers. I'm gonna go to everybody's questions. Um, <laughs> microaggressions are a study. So now we have all these studies so that non-POC people and communities now have a study that says the things that we've been telling them all along as our truths are now a truth. Um, that idea of science, I get super tired of it, but you know, I just wait because it's like, yeah, we knew it. Uh, so microaggressions are this idea of, um, how one thing uh, can get at you, but then eventually they all build up. And I remember many times when I would talk about my education in school and how indigenous people don't have weak immune systems. They just weren't purposely exposed to smallpox before. Um, we're not less of a human than other people, which I think is also something I'm witnessing, unfortunately with COVID is, is just how people are talking about communities of color. Um, and, uh, and so with art, you have to strike a chord in that moment of a second that you have of somebody's attention. I think that that's what led me, all of these, the microaggressions is why I do a lot of pieces, is that one tooth is one moment, many of them coming together shows you an abundance people sometimes don't stick around if they feel that you've only been impacted once, but they weren't there the whole time you've been impacted your entire life. So why do I work in installations? It's to create space that is going to get people to witness feeling and emotion and try to stay longer than the attention span that they're being documented to have today. Um, so, so you have to sometimes throw a lot in, but also lean back and allow the audience to explore. So that's why I don't over label things or over contextualize things because I think that diminishes your audience and their intelligence level. I want them to come in and see what they're going to see, but feel some things. So play with the light, play with the color, um, play with the tonality and texture use everything that you have and then um, lean back and see if it was too much. Um, but, uh, but sometimes I don't know if it's too much. So the, um, that's the thing about art. I would suggest that that's what I do and it's done all right for me. Um, and then in terms of what I see for the future, I would hope to eventually get to a point that I could support future marine biologists and artists, arts and science, um, help youth in, in a way that's gonna support their funding and education. Um, I teach uh, and I really believe in teaching through my experience and gifting that back that what I've been gifted is like a return. So I have that responsibility. Um, and, uh, and then 
I would like to personally apply more of ceramics as material in science-based projects and revert away from rebar and PVC pipes and plastics and, and see if there's an alternative. I know people have been working on that, but I think that I could, um, I could give back in that way. And uh, yeah, so I have a lot going on in my head, um, but um, how do we teach art and science and in the world to our kids? We take them outside and we have them witness what they are living with daily. And even if they don't have the outside, if it's just riding a subway or, you know, wherever you're spending time, you can witness things. And I think that we discredit our ability to be individual scientists and that the act, the act of science is observation, but it's also acknowledging that somebody else has the same um, capability of speaking as you do or anybody else in that space. If we take people's um, personal empowerment away, that their voice is just as important, we lose out on a lot of potential um, Nobel Peace Prize winners. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So uh, I could sit here and talk with you forever, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we do, we have to stop for today. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us for this fantastic conversation with Courtney Leonard. Um, please join us this Friday at seven for our program, Colorful Language, a virtual poetry pop-up. Local poets will recite their rhymes and rhythms inspired by the works in the Norman Bloom Metamorphosis exhibition. Afterwards, engage with the poets in a round of improv poetry. This program is made in partnership with Gallery of Pharaoh and is available on Zoom and Facebook Live. Finally, please join us next Thursday, June 4th at 1 p.m. for our next installation of our Lunch and Learn series featuring the artist Kambui Olujimi. So thank you so much, Courtney, and thank you to everyone for your fantastic questions.